Now that we've talked about an overview of completable futures in general, I'm going to go and give you a bit more description about basic completable future features. And we'll talk about the simple ones first, and then we'll talk about the more advanced ones. You'll need both of these to do the next assignment, although the advanced ones are way more important because otherwise you won't be able to get it to work. So let's talk about what the basic features are. I'll be showing an example here. You can take a look here. This will show you all the stuff we're about to talk about. You can walk through it in more detail if you're curious. So the basic completable futures API looks quite a bit like the futures API. In fact, completable future implements future. So you can see we have the same methods there, plus a few more. And some of the things you can do with the basic future API that is inherited into completable future is you can do time block, blocks and polls. So here's an example where we might go ahead and, and create a completable future by submitting to the common fork join pool a uh, lambda expression that's, in this case, going to multiply two big fractions together. So we're going to run it in, in the background. So by doing submit, this will run in the background. And what we can do here is we can say f.get. And what that will do is that will block this thread until this computation finishes. So that's one of the things you can do with a simple part of completable futures. And then down here, you can see there's a couple of alternatives. You can do timed get. So this will wait up to 10 milliseconds. And this one will just pull. It'll say, is, is the result ready? And if the answer is no, it'll return right away. Otherwise, it'll give you the result. So those are some of the things you can do with the basic features. We don't hardly ever program like that, by the way. But that's what you could do if you were stuck just using the basic stuff. You can also test to see if a future is done or if it's been canceled. And if it isn't done and it hasn't been canceled, we could attempt to cancel it. That's something else we could do with the basic features. For some god knows why reason, completable futures by default cannot be interrupted. You can't cancel them. So you can call cancel all you want, but it doesn't actually have any effect, which is very bizarre. Um, that's actually somewhat different from regular futures. So God knows why that is. You can read about it here, and it gives you a little hint about what you could do about it. But the bottom line is, canceling completable, completable futures takes some extra work. Another thing that they provide in the simple interface is a join method. You'll, you will have to use join in your assignment. There's one place you need to use join. And what join is used to do is it's used to wait for the result to finish, and then it returns the actual value of, that is the result, not a completable future. You use join on a completable future to wait for the result. So it's kind of like if you spawn a thread, you can, you can basically join with the thread. You can wait for the thread to finish. So join sounds all, yeah, uh, Caleb. Yeah, good, good question. So how is join like get? I think that's your question. So it turns out that join behaves like get, except it doesn't require the use of checked exceptions. Get requires checked exceptions. So you can write code like this. You can say, I have a, a collection of futures. I'm going to turn them into a stream. I want to join with each of the elements that has been each of the futures. And I want to collect all that into a list. Whoops, and I see that there's a missing paren here. Um, but you can basically write code like this using join. Whereas if you tried to do this with get, you'd have to write the code like this. You'd have to have a try catch block to catch the, the uh, checked exception, which is obviously very ugly. So checked exceptions and streams really don't go together very well. So that's why they have join. Another thing you can do with a completable future is you can complete it explicitly, which seems a little weird, but it's something you can't easily do with a regular old future. So here's an example. So you might say, uh, new thread. I'm going to make a new background thread. I'm going to start that background thread. I'm going to do some computations in the background. And when I'm done, I'm going to say complete. And I'm going to store the result of the future by calling complete. And when complete finishes, then any calls to join can return. So that's basically saying that the future is now done. Notice how up here we're making a completable future with no value whatsoever, and then we're completing it inside a background thread. And then this join call will block until complete is finished. Any questions about that? Now, it turns out there's another method very similar to complete called 
completed value where you can give a value to a future when you create it. So unlike this approach where we make a future and then we complete it as a separate step, you can also just say completed value and just give it a value. So that'll make a future and complete it. And it turns out that that's a, something you'll need to use for your, your assignment. Okay, so that's the end of the, the basic simple stuff.